Coming up, the homecoming queen who tried to be the kicker on the LSU football team. Mo Isom shares her story. Plus, a pole dancer tries to poison herself. I was a trashy girl. I didn't have a way out. The fairy tale that took her off the stage. I felt so valued. I felt like a daughter. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Despite some military losses in the Middle East, ISIS is developing a worldwide terrorist network, and now it's active in at least 18 countries. And as ISIS gets stronger, one top intelligence official is warning that the United States and the world are now facing more terrorist threats than any time since 9-11. George Thomas has the story. The president says while ISIS has been losing land in Iraq and Syria, the group is working on inspiring and launching terrorist attacks around the world. In fact, the decline of ISIL in Syria and Iraq appears to be causing it to shift to tactics that we've seen before, an even greater emphasis on encouraging high-profile terrorist attacks. And part of that shift is to target Europe. German-born Harry Sarfo, a former ISIS fighter now in prison, told the New York Times that the terror group is instructing European jihadis not to come to Syria anymore, but instead stay home and launch waves of attacks in Britain, Germany and France. Even as we need to crush ISIL on the battlefield, their military defeat will not be enough. So long as their twisted ideology persists and drives people to violence, then groups like ISIL will keep emerging. And it appears ISIS attacks are getting deadlier, more destructive, and more frequent. A new report from the House Homeland Security Committee found that since 2014, there have been 1,600 plus casualties from ISIS-related attacks against the West, the majority of them carried out by independent followers. As we've seen, it is still very difficult to detect and prevent lone actors or small cells of terrorists who are determined to kill the innocent and are willing to die. ISIS claimed responsibility for a number of mass killings recently, including a truck attack in Nice, France, that left 84 dead, and the nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida, that killed 49 people. Terror experts say these and other attacks show that their long-held goal to spread beyond Syria and Iraq is becoming a reality. More than two years after U.S. and coalition forces started military operations against ISIS, the threat from the radical Islamic group is expanding throughout the world. NBC News obtained a map from the president's own National Counterterrorism Center showing ISIS branches now operating in 18 other countries, leading the center's director to make this stark assessment. The array of terrorist actors around the globe is broader, wider and deeper than it has ever been at any time since September 11, 2001. It is fair to say that we face more threats originating in more places and involving more individuals than we have at any time in the past 15 years. George Thomas, CBN News. Well, it looks like the JV team, how it used to be described, has gone varsity. And I think a lot of this is on to our own uh, policy, that we underestimated the threat. We underestimated or didn't even know that when someone declares, I'm the caliph and I am of the family of Muhammad, you owe your allegiance to me. If you're a dedicated Muslim, you have to obey what I tell you to do. Uh, by underestimating that and not taking care of it quickly, uh, it actually allowed it to grow and allowed the ideology to get cemented in that you owe your allegiance to ISIS. And there was even a prediction ISIS can lose battles, ISIS can lose major conflicts, uh, but somehow or other Allah is going to raise it back up again. So at this point in time, if you go in with strong military force, which seems to be what we're doing now, uh, and try to wipe them out, it's just going to embolden uh, the followers who are now worldwide. Uh, it's a failure of our understanding of the threat we were facing. And we need to get that understanding. What exactly is in the Quran that inspires this kind of violence? Uh, why do people think that if you cut off the head of an infidel, somehow that's a ticket to heaven? 
what are these various uh, thought patterns? And if we don't identify it for what it is, and right now you can't even say radical Islam, you, you can't even link the two. Uh, we've got to get open and we've got to get honest about the threat that we're dealing with. Well, in other news, President Obama is denying that his administration paid ransom money to get American hostages out of Iran in January. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Gordon, the president says there was nothing underhanded about that cash payment of $400 million and pointed out that it had already been made public. Some of you may recall, we announced these payments in January. Many months ago, uh, th there wasn't a secret. We, we announced them for all, to all of you. Uh, th this wasn't some uh, nefarious deal. Secretary of State John Kerry also said the U.S. doesn't pay ransom, but congressional Republicans remain critical. Arizona Senator John McCain said, quote, whatever the administration may claim, it is clear that this payment was a ransom for Americans held hostage in Iran. While Republican vice presidential candidate Mike Pence tells CBN News, he believes that $400 million payment puts a price tag on the head of every American. He also talked about the importance of keeping Donald Trump focused on Hillary Clinton's record and away from other controversies in the weeks ahead. Pence said all of that in an interview after a campaign event at the Founders Inn on the CBN campus in Virginia Beach. Gary Lane brings us that story. The Republican vice presidential candidate knew his audience, and it didn't take long for him to acknowledge those who serve in a region of the country where the military and national defense dominate. Would those who've worn the uniform of the United States of America please stand up and allow us to say thank you one more time for your service to this country? Pence talked about the U.S. economy, saying it only grew by 1.2 percent during the last quarter. Under President Obama, the country is experiencing its weakest economic recovery since 1949. They say it's the best we can do. But Donald Trump and I know this. It's not the best we can do, it's just the best they can do. He criticized Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton for the way she handled the terrorist attack in Benghazi. After four Americans fell, Hillary Clinton said, what difference at this point does it make? Well, let me say, as a proud father of a United States Marine, let me say from my heart, anyone who said that Anyone who did that should be disqualified from ever serving as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States of America. Virginia is a key battleground state, and that's why Hillary Clinton chose Senator Tim Kaine to be her running mate. But I talked to the Republican Party chairperson for the state of Virginia. He says that's not going to make a difference. Kaine is not going to do anything for her anywhere else in the country, and, it's, and frankly not here in Virginia. He's seen as a failed governor. Unemployment went way up. We lost tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs when Kaine was governor. After the rally, I asked Governor Pence about the Obama administration's $400 million payment to Iran on the same day four Americans were freed in Tehran. I, I think in doing that, and they put a price tag on the head of every American overseas. Iran is the leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world, giving them currency that they can make available to other terrorist organizations jeopardizes American citizens and jeopardizes our allies. I also asked about reported Republican Party disunity and his endorsement of U.S. House Speaker Paul Ryan. As Donald Trump said, he's not there yet, but I really believe as is it time coming? goes on. I, I believe as time goes on. Uh, you're going to see uh, these two men come together and work together. Some Republicans say Trump needs to work harder, limiting his comments to Hillary Clinton's record and his plans to bring about change from the Obama years. How do you get him on message? Well, look, uh, Donald Trump is uh, a man who has spoken from his heart and from his mind from the very outset of this campaign. And he's made a connection with the American people, the likes of which I haven't seen since the days of Ronald Reagan. But Ronald Reagan was also a former actor who stuck to the script. And some in the GOP worry that getting Trump to do the same while still allowing Trump to be Trump may be the Republicans' biggest challenge in the days ahead. Gary Lane, CBN News, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Thanks, Gary. Turning overseas, CBN Superbook is gaining popularity throughout Asia. Earlier this year, it premiered with school children in Nepal. 
And now, for the first time, the animated Bible series was presented in Hong Kong at a popular Chinese book fair. Lucille Toulousan has that story. Each year, nearly a million people flock to the Hong Kong book fair. Here, book lovers eagerly line up to get discounts in the packed convention center. It is also a venue where new products are being promoted, like these DVDs of the animated Bible stories of Superbook. They are now available in the Cantonese and Mandarin languages. Although Superbook only had a short stint on Hong Kong television last year, it has gained fans. CBN Hong Kong General Manager Ho Yin Lam says some super fans were delighted to see Superbook in the book fair. Because the parent is like very dramatic. He said, oh, I found Superbook here. The most important point we sell to the parents or the uh, teacher is that uh, Superbook is a um, good moral education. There seems to be a spiritual magnet in this super book booth here in the biggest book fair in Hong Kong. More and more children and their parents are getting attracted to the animated shows. This is an opportunity for super book to be more popular and for the children to learn more Bible stories. Hopefully my daughter will be go to church, be a Christian too, but I cannot con control her. Then I want to let her in the life to see and can have in her, in her mind, can have some mindset for the Bible and the God. School counselor Yuk Chi Fong used Superbook in an academic experiment among her students who lacked motivation and self-confidence. She let her students watch Superbook during lunchtime and page through the discussion guide. One special result is they finished all their assignments. They said they have more confidence in present themselves. Some are still willing to eat their lunch. Fong believes biblical materials like Superbook are packaged in a way that attracts kids and helps them to make positive choices when they grow up. Hong Kong is too much focused on money. The future for most of the parents is looking for when their children grow up. Positive value is very important. I think this animation can help them, show them there's a better value you can look forward to. Lucille Talusen, CBN News, Hong Kong. Gordon, kids, their parents, and their teachers all becoming fans of Superbook. Yeah, it's happening. We're showing it around the world. We've got a broadcast map for you showing all the various different languages uh, where Superbook is currently uh, airing. And uh, we're, we've got 38 languages so far on our way to 50 languages. And then once we conquer 50, we want to take it to 500 languages. We want to see the children of the world know the stories of the Bible. Uh, and that's why we're doing this. And you can be a part of it. Uh, we're having a very special offer this summer uh, for a Superbook Summer. And if you want to get, in, get involved in it and be a part of the production costs, the distribution costs, the translation costs, join the Superbook DVD Club. Right now we're offering uh, our Superbook Explorer series, which has the story of uh, Paul and the shipwreck. It also has the story of Jonah. And then we'll also send you two other episodes in the beginning, uh, the story of the Garden of Eden and then Revelation. Uh, and your kids can have uh, Superbook DVDs right in your own home. So we'll send you five DVDs for a gift of $25 or more. And your gift will go into the production costs, translation costs, distribution costs, so you can be a part of sharing the stories of the Bible with the children of the world. If that's you, give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. Wendy? The summer of adventure. You forgot to say it's the summer of adventure okay, for I Superbook. Forgot. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite part. You're into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, come, it's, it's a great thing to get. Well, coming up, it's called the Worship Wagon, and it's bringing church to the unreached. It's really fun because we'll set up sometimes about 5.30 in the evening, and no one will be here. And then we'll get the music going, and you'll see people just drifting out of the woods, and those are our parishioners. You'll meet the duo behind this church on wheels when we come back. An outreach ministry in Kansas City, Missouri has come up with a unique way to reach the city's homeless population. Instead of people going to church, it brings church to the people with a vehicle called the Worship Wagon. And as Charlene Aaron reports, 
Lives are being restored one service at a time. Songs of praise fill the air under this bridge near downtown Kansas City. This church behind me, which doesn't have any walls and no pews, is touching the lives of some of the most unreached people in the heart of Kansas City. Welcome to the Worship Wagon, a mobile church serving the poor and homeless. Those attending this church on wheels participate in a weekly non-denominational service each Monday night and are encouraged to come as they are. Bruce McGregor and Joe Ratterman came up with the idea. It's really fun because we'll set up sometimes about 5.30 in the evening and no one will be here. And then we'll get the music going and you'll see people just drifting out of the woods, which is behind us along with the Missouri River, where about 100 people live, 100 homeless people live there year round. And those are our parishioners. My wife and I were working with the homeless for uh, about 12 years now. And um, we, were, we tried really hard uh, in a few different ways to, you know, think about taking people out of the street and uh, into, a, a, you know, a world in which we feel more comfortable. And uh, we learned some lessons that way that uh, maybe that's not always the best way to, to bring, you know, God's word to those people. We decided to bring the church onto the street instead. Each week, volunteers from local churches fill the wagon with equipment needed for the service. We just have a simple single axle trailer. But in that trailer, we have packed it out. We have a really professional grade uh, sound system that's very compact and we can wheel it out and get it set up very quickly. We have a quiet generator, you can't even hear it, but it powers the whole sound system. So we can, we can have a complete band here playing worship music with just that system. And, and then also in the trailer, we've got a ton of chairs. And then we, during the winter, we put a commercial grade heater. It runs off diesel and electricity. I mean, it looks like a huge, uh, uh, satellite installation is so big, but it heats up this whole area under the bridge. So some guys will just come to get warm and then they hear the gospel. And so it's fun to see how that happens. Rain or shine, the wheels keep rolling. We've been down here every Monday but one for a year and a half. And the only reason we missed it was because uh, this road over here was uh, too icy to drive down. Um, but we've been down here when it's uh, in the teens howling uh, north winds and we're all shivering in our, uh, in our, in our caps and gloves. Uh, and uh, we've been out here when it's been 100 degrees and there's been thunderstorms rolling around as well, uh, rain. So, you know, we've been blessed with this amazing location that covers us. And so, you know, as long as there's not a tornado right on top of us or ice on the street, I think we have, you know, license to basically come down here and set up shop. Volunteer Melvin Cole says he often sees extraordinary reaction from those in the audience during worship. Some of the people will just get up and high five you <laughs> right in the middle of the song and they'll dance around. I mean, I dance with them, you know, I get out and just shake hands, dance with them. You really want the people to feel connected and that we all are worshiping God together. Beverly Cole saw her life transformed by the ministry, a message she now shares with others. I was a drug addict for, for many, many years, you know, and I know God changed me from the inside out, so I know if he could change me, he could change anybody. Meanwhile, the worship wagon plans to continue bringing church to the down and out in need of hope and healing. God works with us where we're at. You know, I think that's the biggest uh, story here about you know, Worship Wagon is you know, bringing God uh, and being his, his eyes and ears, hands and feet where the people are at instead of thinking that you can bring the people to where you're at. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Kansas City, Missouri. I love this story. I love this outreach. One of my mottos is Jesus sends. And can he send you to do a ministry like that? Just realize there are ministry opportunities all around you every single day. And could you organize your church? Could you organize a group to say, okay, uh, let's go to the least of these, uh, the brethren of Jesus, the ones he wants to send us to. Can we go to them and share the good news that there's a way out for them, that he values them infinitely, and he values them so much, he wants to send you to send the gospel to them. It's wonderful. It's wonderful news and a wonderful program. Wendy? Here I am. Send me, right? Isaiah. Okay. You going to go? I'm ready. Let's All right. go. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. He doesn't know where I want to go, though. But um, up uh, next. It's <laughs> some mountain somewhere, I think. <laughs> yep. My up next. Is Sherpas. <laughs> Did you hear about that? <laughs> okay. No, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, I just I, made I, that up. Yeah. I want to go. I want to do Everest. You're Everest, going to do Everest? I, I want to do Everest Base Camp. Yeah. You brought up the Sherpas. You just said it. So, oh, yeah. obviously, you have, you're very prophetic. All right. Stay okay. tuned. We'll have video. <laughs> <laughs> from the base camp. Uh, up next, a teenage runaway walks right into the burgeoning sex trade industry. She said, call me if you ever need help. And I remember saying to her, I would never do that. Watch how this young girl discovers her real purpose in life when we come back. Tammy was a teenage runaway who said she felt like trash. She turned to dancing in a club just to make ends meet. And the worst part wasn't the men or the drugs or the poison she took to take her out of her misery. It was the nagging feeling that she was made for so much more. When I was growing up, I would hear a voice you were made for more. And those words tormented me because they were so opposite of my experience. My mom and my stepdad were addicts, drug addicts. And so I was raised in a lot of sexual abuse, a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of physical abuse. And on top of that, lived with a lot of anger and hate toward myself. I felt like if I'm not loved, then there's something about me that's not lovable. I left home when I was 15 years old. I dropped out of school. I ended up with a boyfriend that was willing to take me out of the situation. And I ended up in a worse situation, but just in a different kind of way. There was a lot of sexual perversion. I just had no value. I had no sense of worth, but I had nowhere to go. I met a woman who was a entertainment dancer and she gave me her number on a piece of paper and said, call me if you ever need help. And I remember saying to her, I would never do that. I was in a hopeless situation that I didn't know how to get out of. I remember pouring different poisons into a glass in the bathroom and shaking it up and drinking it because life wasn't worth living. Instead of dying, I threw my guts up. I thought that my only option was dancing because I didn't have a way out. Let's take a ride into the night for fame and money. The first time that I ever walked into the club, I wanted to run. Drugs became my best friend, really, because they helped me to morph into this person that I wasn't. I remember feeling like such trash. I was a trashy girl. And so dancing, I really felt like I acted out and it just reaffirmed how I felt about myself. I met this guy named Aaron when I was 16 years old and he was just a really great guy and we began dating almost immediately. But as I was struggling at work, I had no other woman that was a normal woman to talk to, to try to understand what it was that I was experiencing. My boyfriend's mother continued to be heavy on my heart to go and talk to. I didn't feel any sense of shame or embarrassment after talking to her. She just loved on me, she gave me a hug, and that began a beautiful, beautiful relationship. She came to me one day and she said, I 
have been talking to my sisters and we are going to help you to get a job. I couldn't believe what was happening to me. It felt almost like a fairy tale. I'm working downtown Houston and feeling on top of the world. And yet I was still the same me on the inside. It wasn't enough to fill my emptiness. When I married Erin, and we have this beautiful baby, I looked in her little face, and I remember thinking, if I don't have God, I am going to mess her up. Now, I started going to church. I walked the aisle, and I professed faith in Christ, and I looked like I was a Christian, but had not yet found a relationship with God. There was a prayer event at a friend's church. And I remember going to a couple of classes and just saying, God, I want what they have. I want to know you. I don't know how to know you, but would you please, you know, save me? Would you please um, change me? Would you please make me like them? In an instant, he came rushing down on me, and I felt love like I've never known. Peace like I had never known. I'd never known peace. I felt so valued. I felt like a daughter. <laughs> I couldn't put the Bible down. God began working on my heart, really helping me to work through all of the brokenness of my past. And I think that's why I love Jesus so much is he, He's given me life and He's given me a reason to live. And He'll do the same for you. He'll give you purpose. He'll give you a reason. But most of all, He'll give you His love unconditional, overwhelming love just for who you are and just for where you are. The wonderful thing, though, is he loves you so much he doesn't want to leave you where you are. He wants to give you dignity. He wants to give you a hope and a future. And the wonderful promise in the Psalms that he takes people from the ash heap and he sits them with the princes. That's what he wants to do. He wants to give you nobility again. He values you that much. Now, what does it take to get this? Well, Tammy tried a lot of different things, but it wasn't until she finally opened up and said, Jesus, I need you now. Here's a prayer for you. It's a very simple one. Jesus, if this is real, if you really are the Savior, if you're my Savior, could you show me? Could you show up for me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, there's a wonderful Bible verse for you. When you seek me with all of your heart, then you'll find me. And when you find him, you find that love. You find that acceptance. You find what you've been looking for all along. If this is for you, don't turn away. Don't let another day go by. Pray that prayer with me and see what Jesus will do for you. Bow your head, close your eyes. Let's pray together and let's let God do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right, say his name, say it out loud, Jesus. I come to you, and I want to know that you're real. So Jesus, you know the things that I've done wrong. You know everything about me. I ask now that you would forgive me, that you would cleanse me, that you would give me a hope and a future. And Jesus, if you do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. 
Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in, their, in your love. I ask that you fill them to overflowing, that you let them know right now their prayer has been heard and has been answered. Fill them, Lord God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to tell somebody else. The reason is the Bible says that if you'll believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So pick up the phone. Give us a call. 1-800-759-0700. When you call, I've got something free for you. It's a CD packet um, where we show you what Christians believe. And what do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? Absolutely free. Phone calls free. Packets free. All you have to do is call us and we'll send it to you. 1-800-759-0700. Wendy, over to you. Thanks, Gordon. Still ahead, the All-American who wrecked her life and then saved it in the process. College soccer star Mo Isam shares her story. Don't go away. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Earlier this week, we told you about the Satanic Temple pushing for after-school Satan clubs for kids. Now an attorney for Child Evangelism Fellowship is fighting back, defending school districts from the effort. Liberty Council Chairman Matt Staver is calling the Satanic Temple's goal disruptive rather than educational. And parents aren't happy about the proposal either. Staver says Liberty Council will defend districts from possible legal action. He adds that permission from parents is required for children to participate in after-school clubs, and he doubts that many parents would let their child join Satan clubs. Operation Blessing is working through a local church partner to aid refugees from Iraq arriving in Jordan, especially Christian families. Many of these families have been forced by ISIS to leave their homes, and every day they're arriving in Jordan looking for a place to live. Operation Blessing helped provide their needs from food packages, hygiene supplies, mattresses, and even medicine. They're also helping refugee women with sewing machines and other materials in order to get them working and back on their feet. And you can find more about Operation Blessing by going to their website, ob.org. Gordon and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Mo Isom is an incredible athlete. She's appeared on ESPN and has been featured in the pages of Sports Illustrated. But one day, while in the middle of a standout soccer career, suddenly Mo was upside down in a crumpled up Jeep fighting for her life. LSU soccer icon Mo Isom became the team's starting goalie as a freshman and never looked back. All through her time at LSU, she was celebrated for her skills and became the first female athlete to try out for the men's football team, and in 2011 was named homecoming queen. On the outside, Mo appeared to have it all, but on the inside, she wrestled with a poor self-image. In my brokenness, the storms were all I could really see. I struggled with an eating disorder. Suicide was a part of my story, horrific car accident. In her book, Wreck My Life, she tells the story of her journey from being broken to becoming bold and where she found her true self-worth. Mo Isom's book, Wreck My Life, is available now, and she joins us now for the rest of her incredible story. Mo, welcome to the 700 Club. Great to meet Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here. Well, I was reading your book last night. Wow. You start with a wreck. I mean, yes. and it's like so on, keeps you on the edge. And so you're, you're on your way home for Thanksgiving break, on your way home to Atlanta in your Jeep, driving along one o'clock in the morning, nobody on the road, what happened? So I was headed home after what had been several years of so much adversity, so much um, difficulty, and I was headed home just really in this dark place, yeah. um, understanding you know, why my dad had done what he did, seeing it as a viable option, I was just very lost and broken and the cry of my heart through that year had really been, God, if you're so real, do something. Your Reveal had, yourself to your me. Your dad had committed suicide. My dad had committed suicide. How, how 
long he before had, that. He uh, had died in January of 2009, and this was then Thanksgiving of 2009. Oh, um, right. And so it had been a year of running into promiscuity, depression, anxiety, just seeking any sin-sized piece to fill the God-sized hole within me. Um, and the cry of my heart had been, God, just wreck my life. Just, just end it well, because I'm so what tired. What happened with the accident? You're, there, you, there were no other, you didn't hit another car. What happened? No, he answered that prayer quite literally. Um, just driving and, and realized, kind of snapped out of it. I was in the center median. Um, my wheels were just cranking and jerking, and I'm like, Mo, snap out of it, get back on the road. I yeah. tried to correct my vehicle, um, shot straight across the interstate, flipped my Jeep three times, going 80 miles an hour, landed upside down in a ravine at oh 1.30 gosh. in the morning, completely physically broken, completely alone. Were you able to call for help? Did anyone come to your rescue? So this is what yeah. I think God just likes to show off sometimes. <laughs> there had been one man on the road that night who was a good ways back and had just vaguely seen my lights flicker. Mm. Um, ended up being a retired paramedic and in the Navy, of all people that could have come across the scene. Amazing. Um, a, a man who was, was very prepared and uh, he said he crawled down into the ravine. He talked to my mom after the accident um, and was preparing himself to find a dead body. My, mm. my Jeep was just annihilated. And he said he shined the flashlight in the car and it caught my face. And somehow I had wiggled out of my seatbelt and I was on the roof of the car because it was upside down. Oh my gosh. And uh, he said he, he caught my face and it was bloody and, and, and bruised when I was smiling and just kept repeating the same words over and over. God is beautiful. God is beautiful. You, in your book, you say you saw somebody in the passenger seat? Um, you know, it was a surreal moment when I lost control of my vehicle and, and I felt like the presence of my dad was almost there mm. in that moment with me. Um, it, was, it was fast and it was overwhelming, but when that wreckage um, finished and I was hanging upside down, that was where the Holy Spirit came into that wreckage, met me, yeah. and just filled my heart completely. It was overwhelming. Well, leading up, We'll get to the, the recovery, because obviously you're fully recovered, thank goodness. But <laughs> leading up to that wreck, you know, you said your dad had committed suicide um, several months late, earlier. Mm -hmm. And you were basically looking for love in all the wrong places. Right. So I had, I had really grown up um, sort of in what I like to call a faith by inheritance. Um, kind of in church on Sunday and, and Bible study on Wednesday and FCA on Friday. but kind of had this misunderstanding about um, what faith in God and Christ really was. Um, and that was kind of, um, I guess, the platform for a lack of understanding about what God said about me. And you talk about the spiritual warfare because actually that night before the wreck, you were on your way home and, and you had you had a hookup waiting for you. You had a guy, a, a boyfriend. Right. Exactly. Um, maybe not a boyfriend, but a boy um, waiting for you. And you knew it was wrong, but yet you, you, and, and you had the spiritual warfare going on inside of you. Right. And, and what was going on? It was um, a desperate girl doing desperate things because I didn't feel loved. Yeah. And I didn't know the love of God at that time. Um, I was just seeking it anywhere. Um, that I could find a fix and, and numb the pain and numb the confusion and numb the lack of identity that I felt. Um, and yeah, I, I had someone waiting at home and um, that was sort of the rhythm of my days at that time, um, just seeking men to fill um, a spiritual hole in my heart and emptiness. Well, you're not alone. I mean, a lot of women, a lot of women in the church, I mean, right. if they don't feel that love and if they haven't had that love from a father figure and then they haven't figured out how to get that from their heavenly father, right. have gone down that road. And you talk about that and, it's, and you're very real about that. And so I appreciate that. But when you had that wreck, it was like the light bulb went on. You knew God was getting a hold of you. It was like God just downloaded the depth of the gospel into my heart into what it meant, what the sacrifice on the cross had meant and what it said about me. Mm -hmm. He said, you are seen, you are known, you are loved, you are fiercely loved. I have plans for you, I have purpose for you. And this adversity, it doesn't define you. It, it, it isn't the, the, the anthem of your days, these struggles. The enemy is going to wage battles, but I have overcome the war. And so place your faith in me, the master artist. Allow me to recraft your broken pieces yeah. and see what I do with your life. And you know, Mo, I want to ask you something really quick before we run out of time, because you actually try, you were a star soccer player at LSU. 
but you decided to try out for the men's football team. Why yes. and how did that go? Oh, that was a fun part of the journey. Um, you can read all about it in Wreck My Life. That was really um, a calling that God put on my heart um, to to take a step of faith, you know, to step into a journey where I didn't know what the outcome would be. Um, but to have the faith to walk through it and to see what he would do in and through it. Um, and you trained with them for 18 months. 18 months how did with the those guys, guys. How did the guys accept you? Oh, they were wonderful. They were incredible. You know, I trained um, amongst them in the facilities with soccer for several years. I mean, we all you, trained Did you together. have to really pile on the muscle? Girl, I was 208 pounds of muscle. Go <laughs> ahead. Go ahead. Well, you're 6'1". You can pull it off. You're 6'1". I, I, I decently pulled it off, but I could lift with the best of them. Um, all what of the fitness, the running. Man, I, it was crazy. I, I, that's pretty amazing. I, I admire <laughs> that. Um, well, we are almost out of time, but you. I just want to mention that you are married now yes. to a wonderful man. You have a seven-month-old daughter. Yes. Auden Noel, Jeremiah Aiken, he's the best kind of man. Um, and my sweet daughter, Auden, uh, is just about to be eight months and it's flying by wow. so quickly. Well, but so, they're a blessing. So much more we didn't get to, Mo, but uh, it's all in here. If you want to hear more yes. from Mo, check out our behind the scenes interview with her on Facebook Live. You can watch it at facebook.com slash 700 club. And don't forget, the book is called Wreck My Life, Journeying from Broken to Bold, available nationwide. Awesome to meet you. God bless you. Thank, Thank you so much, so much for your testimony. I well, coming up, we'll open our inbox for another round of Bring It On. Julia says, I can't seem to shake the guilt from things I've done in the past. How do I forgive myself? We'll weigh in on that question and much more, so stay tuned. Well, the proud parents of baby DS love to show off their child. Good reason. He has a smile that can light up a room. But not long ago, DS was kept hidden from his neighbors because he was born with a cleft lip. Lilis and Usi brought their baby son to this hospital in Indonesia, hoping he would receive free cleft palate surgery, which had been set up by CBN. Until that morning, they had never known anyone who had undergone this type of operation. The thought of Diaz having a surgery scared me. I was worried what he would look like when it was done. For two years, Lilo Sanucci had tried to have a baby. They were heartbroken by their son's condition and by what their neighbors said. When they saw my son sleep, they said, aren't you sorry this baby was born? I couldn't stop crying. So I kept Diaz inside the house until we could get him surgery. Usi sells school supplies by motorcycle, which barely provides food for the family. He worried about what his son would face. When he got older, I knew that he would be mocked by his friends. It was so painful. That day at the hospital, the couple received good news. CBN would provide free surgery for their son. Baby Diaz was soon taken back to the operating room where a surgeon repaired his cleft lip. Today, Diaz is now the talk of his village for all the right reasons. My son is so handsome. I think he has a bright future. I am so grateful to CBN for helping our son. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Be a part of it. Be a part of everything we're doing around the world. How? By just joining the 700 Club. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing to help people. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International to preach the gospel around the world. You're a part of all of it when you join with us. How much is it? It's just $20 a month, and that breaks out to 65 cents a day. And you join with tens of thousands of people that want to make a difference in the world. So if that's you, call us right now, 1-800-759-0700. When you call and pledge, I've got something for you. It's my father's latest teaching, Victory Through Life Storms. In this DVD, we're going to show you stories of people that have gotten victory. We're not just talking about surviving, but they've gotten victory. And it reinforces it's from faith to faith, from glory to glory. And it's all uh, in here. Uh, and on top of it, there's a teaching from my father about how God has guided him through life. And I can tell you, in his 86 years, he's gone through a lot of storms and he's found victory too. So it's victory through life storms. 
It's yours when you join us or call us. 1-800-759-0700. Wendy? All right. Before we bring it on, we just want to remind you that you can send us your questions and prayer requests on Facebook. It's uh, facebook.com slash 700 club. And while you're there, be sure to check out the behind the scenes interview with soccer star Mo Isom that we just did. So we want you to see that as well. All right. You ready, Gordon? Right. Uh, I think I am. I'm <laughs> I ready think. as I'm going to be. All right. Julius Maybe Rice. I need a Sherpa guide. <laughs> Okay, so he says, I don't have a problem for giving others, but I find that I can't shake the guilt of things I've done in the past. How do I forgive myself? Uh, Julius, you're, you're hitting on, on something that I think is hard for a lot of Christians. Uh, and, you know, you, you, you go through life and you say, well, uh, some of my sins were just mistakes. Uh, some of my sins were uh, I didn't know any better. But then you have the ones where you knew better and you still did it. And, and those are the hard ones. And those are the ones where, what do I do with this? Um, I, I would encourage you to, to write them out and write them out on paper. And then I've seen this happen. I've, I've, in fact, we had a um, testimony just last week on this uh, where the sins were written out on, on pieces of paper and then they were taken to a cross and a nail mm -hmm. and a hammer and these sins were nailed to that cross, where you understand that Jesus forgives mm -hmm. even your intentional sin. I find that incredible. His, he forgives even that. So go and nail it to the cross and realize that God doesn't even remember it anymore. He keeps no record of wrongs. He separates you from your sin as far as the east is from the west. And continue to encourage yourself with these words from the Bible, that when Jesus said it's finished, it's finished. You're forgiven. You're set free from that. There aren't any consequences for you. You don't have to walk in guilt and shame. For now, there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Pray until you get the breakthrough so that you can be free. Mm, that's so good. Thanks, Gordon. Well, Michael writes in, is there anything in the Bible about who we were or where we were before being born into this life? Could we have existed in heaven before coming here? Uh, Michael, there's some, uh, I'll call them strange teaching go going around that somehow or other we pre-existed as souls. Uh, and I just... I don't buy into that. I don't see that in the Bible. Um, when, when, you, when you start down that road, you're also starting down the road of reincarnation. Uh, and it's appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. Um, look instead at, you know, when you were in your mother's womb, I formed you. Uh, and realize that each one of us individually has that breath of life given to Adam. So Adam was first formed from clay, and then God breathed into him, and he became a living soul at that point in time. So when God is forming you in your mother's womb, that point in time where you become quickened, uh, that's the point that you have a living soul, and that is the point you came into being. We leave you these words from Psalm 20. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. For Wendy, for all of her Sherpas, for me, <laughs> for all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you next week.